Welcome to The Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that teaches you how to think and solve problems with fun, interactive lessons in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Of course, you knew that. With Brilliant's hands-on approach, you'll learn by doing instead of listening to lectures. It's a better and more fun way to learn. All of Brilliant's courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve. Brilliant offers many well-curated sequences of problems that help you to master all sorts of technical subjects. If you're interested in physics, you can try out their courses on classical mechanics and gravitational physics. If you like computers and coding, you can check out their courses on computer science fundamentals and programming with Python. Anyway, Brilliant has a vast array of courses, lots and lots in other fields as well, that can help you achieve your goals in STEM, starting with one small commitment to learning and building up to long-term challenge and growth. To check out the many courses available and find out the one that's right for you, you can go to brilliant.org. And to get a free sign up for free or free trial, you go to brilliant.org slash Michael Shermer. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-H-E-R-M-E-R. Just make sure you get it right. Brilliant.org slash Michael Shermer. You sign up for free and uh, give it a shot. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in all forms of online content. I consume a lot of it myself and Brilliant is a great new website. Check it out. All right. Thanks for listening. And here's the podcast. My guest today is Craig Whitlock. His new book is The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. Craig is an investigative reporter for the Washington Post. He has covered the global war on terrorism for the Post since 2001 as a foreign correspondent, Pentagon reporter, and national security specialist. In 2019, his coverage of the war in Afghanistan won the George Polk Award for Military Reporting, the Scripps Howard Award for Investigative Reporting, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Freedom of Information Award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for International Reporting. He's a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and he lives in Maryland. So Craig and I talk about um, what happened, uh, why we were attacked on 9-11, and how the U.S. government's response to it was completely supported by the American public, and then what went wrong from there. We make comparisons of the uh, Afghanistan papers to the Pentagon papers, and then comparing the Afghan war with the Vietnam War uh, and the documents that they got at the Washington Post that they started publishing, which then became this book, uh, and what they revealed about not just the spin doctoring that governments usually employ, but also straight-out lies. I mean, Bush would say one thing on national television, and Rumsfeld would issue a memo at the same day saying the complete opposite of what was actually going on in Afghanistan. We talk about uh, terrorism as an existential threat. It's not. Uh, And what motivates terrorists? Is it U.S. foreign policy? Is it personal gain? Is it Islam and their religious beliefs? Is it boredom? (laughs) What is it that these people are motivated to do and why they hate us? They don't hate us, as Bush said, because of our freedom, that there are other motives there. Uh, We talk about if if Trump had been reelected, how the withdrawal from Afghanistan might have been different. Probably not much. Uh, This is always going to happen. We talk about game theory and escalation games that even if both parties in a contest are rational and trying not to end up in a catastrophic ending, end up doing so anyway. And wars are very much like an escalation game. Um, We talk about nation building and what the idea was behind that, how that evolved from the original mission in Afghanistan. And... Uh, and then we talk about uh, comparison, comparing uh, Donald Rumsfeld with Robert McNamara and uh, how both of them kind of got themselves in these escalation game traps uh, that ended up where we are today. So enjoy this conversation. Uh, it was very revealing to me. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast. If you want to support it, you can go to skeptic.com slash donate. Uh, The podcast is supported by the Skeptic Society, a 501c3 nonprofit. So your support of the podcast through skeptic.com slash donate uh, is a tax write-off for you. Okay, thanks for listening. Greg Whitlock, thanks for coming on the show. What a great honor to have you. Uh, 
You're a longtime uh, correspondent that I've been reading, and your book, I'll have already given it a proper introduction, but the Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. Uh, so, but before we get into that, why don't you give us a secret history of Craig Whitlock? <laughs> Where are you from? Where did you get educated? How did you get, become a, a war on terror correspondent? <laughs> uh, well, th- that, that's not such a secret history, but I was <laughs> born in upstate New York and grew up in Pennsylvania in a little town called Kennett Square, the mushroom hmm. capital of the world. <laughs> uh, I went to college at Duke University in North Carolina, spent several years there working as a reporter for the Raleigh News and Observer, and I've been at the Washington Post since 1998. So uh, my whole career, I've been a a news reporter, and for most of it at the Washington Post. Nice. Yeah, very good. Yeah, the Post. So did you notice any changes there after Bezos bought it? Yeah, of course, a a lot. So I sort of been through the ups and downs uh, financially at the Washington Post. You know, when I started back in the late 90s, it was, uh, you know, we had an enormous newsroom, both nationally and internationally. Uh, Things kind of scaled back, particularly after the recession in 2007, 2008. There was a big shift uh, economically and financially in our business model from print advertising to digital advertising and more recently digital subscriptions. Fortunately, when Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post from the Graham family uh, back in 2013, he gave us a lot of space to experiment and change our business model. And that's been pretty successful. The The Post used to be an international and national paper, but all of its subscribers were within 100 miles of Washington, D.C., reading the print edition. Uh, but these days, more than 95% of our readers are from outside Washington. Uh, so it's it's been a big shift in that regard. And fortunately, now we're in much firmer financial footing than we were, say, 10 years ago. Yeah, that's it's it's been a thing I've been tracking as a publisher of a print magazine myself, Skeptic. It's how much free content do we give away online? And then why would anybody pay us? <laughs> and then how are we going to pay our bills? Uh, and so on. And so you kind of try to uh, trickle it out a little bit free and then ho- hopefully people subscribe. It looks like the Was- Washington Post will will survive along with the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and a few of the other bigger big ones like LA Times here. Um, yeah, so that'll be that, that'll be interesting to see how that shakes out for the f- future of journalism. But it does seem to be going strong at the Washington Post. You want to just knock this one out of the ballpark that you guys are now just a, a left wing liberal progressive rag because uh, Bezos hates Trump. Yeah, well, I I think I can knock that one out of the ballpark. So first of all, Bezos has absolutely nothing to do with our day-to-day news gathering or what we publish. You know, he's certainly the owner of the Washington Post, but, you know, he's he's got plenty of other things to do. And so I think he weighs in from time to time on our business strategies, but I think he could care less about, you know, what we print day-to-day. You know, the the thing I would like to emphasize, though, is one thing in our business model that we've relearned is the value that readers put on quality, high caliber investigative reporting. And that's something that Bezos has really expanded in our newsroom or the number of investigative reporters, whether it's the group I'm in that does long form investigative reporting that can take months or even years to pull together or whether it's investigative reporting on a day-to-day basis. We've really expanded our capabilities in that regard. And we found through surveys that this is something that our readers particularly value and are willing to pay for as part of a subscription in the Washington Post. And that investigative reporting has nothing to do with, with, you know, partisan politics or anything like that. People know it when they see it, and they they really appreciate it, particularly when it's nonpartisan. So, we have a long tradition of this at the Washington Post, and it's something we've been able to expand in recent years. And the the Afghanistan Papers in my book is is a good example of that. I've spent years on this project, uh, both for coverage in, in the Washington Post and for this book. It's very expensive because we had to sue the government to get the documents that we use as the basis for the book. So, uh, you know, this is something that takes a lot of time and money, but fortunately, the Post has has put its muscle behind it. And again, our readers have told us this is what they really value. This is what they want us to spend our our time on. Yeah, and I'm really grateful for the book because uh, I only got snippets in the paper and you know we were all busy doing other things and there's so much content 
available online competing for eyeballs. Uh, so it's nice to have it in just one solid package. And I have to tell you, after reading your book, I felt the same way I did after binge watching uh, Ken Burns's what 14 hour documentary series on the Vietnam War. It's just so depressing. Uh, it's just so obviously it was a terrible idea. And 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 yet, you know, we just get pulled along by this, I guess, mission creep and probably loss aversion and and uh, sunk cost uh, bias. You know, we can't pull out now because we've already sunk X amount into and that just accumulates every year. And so just give us a quick comparison of the uh, Afghanistan papers to the Pentagon papers and the Afghan war, Afghanistan war to the Vietnam war. Yeah, sure. So there's some real similarities, but some distinct differences, too. The Pentagon Papers were a top secret classified study of the war in Vietnam that was commissioned by then Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. Uh, and to this day, it's kind of unclear exactly what McNamara was hoping to accomplish with this. But he tasked this assignment to several researchers in the Pentagon. And it was so top secret that the researchers were uh, prohibited from interviewing anybody for this history of the war. They had to rely completely on uh, documents like intelligence assessments, military memos, diplomatic cables. You know, anything that was already written down was fair game, but they weren't allowed to interview anybody because then word might leak out. Now, of course, the Pentagon Papers did leak out in the end. Daniel Zellsberg gave a copy to the New York Times and to the Washington Post, and that's how it was made public. Um, but this, the Pentagon Papers is this enormous number of volumes that really documented this history of U.S. military involvement in Vietnam and showed time and again how the U.S. government had lied to the American people about what was going on there and omitted some really uh, pertinent events in, in the Vietnam War. That a lot of stuff was kept under wraps. Now, that's the similarity with the Afghanistan Papers. Um, the Afghanistan papers at their core are, are a study of the war in Afghanistan about mistakes that were made there by the United States over 20 years. But in contrast to the Pentagon papers, the Afghanistan papers consist almost entirely of interviews. These were uh, notes and transcripts of more than 400 interviews that a not very well-known federal agency called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction had conducted with uh, people at all levels of involvement in the war, from White House officials to generals and diplomats and aid workers and, and Afghans uh, who had played a, some kind of role in the war over 20 years. So these interviews and documents, are they're, they're not dry. They're very frank and forthright with people anguishing all the mistakes that were made in Vietnam. The other difference with the Pentagon Papers is that the Afghanistan documents were not classified. This was unclassified material, but uh, the special inspector general wanted to keep these notes and interviews uh, a secret. They didn't want to make them public, and the Washington Post had to sue twice under the Freedom of Information Act in federal court to compel the inspector general to release this material. Uh, and so we were finally successful in that, but it took three years in federal court for us to pry these documents loose. How do you know in that time that they don't redact a bunch of stuff that's even more damning than what you already published? Well, we know exactly what they do redact, because when they released information, they did redact uh, a number of names of people who gave interviews and some of the things they said. And they, they tried to classify some material after the fact in the interviews. We've been fighting that in court. In fact, we're fighting this in our lawsuit, our FOIA lawsuit to this day to force them wow to unredact some of the material that they blacked out. Uh, by and large, most of the comments in these interviews were released, so we know the substance of the interviews. What we're still really missing are the identities of about two-thirds of the people who gave interviews. We know them by their job description, like if they were a, a NATO official or someone who worked at the State Department or things like that. And the Post was able to identify independently the names of a lot of these people. But you know, still we're fighting for, for their names because we think it's important if these people are criticizing the conduct of the war and revealing uh, all these mistakes that were made or how the strategy was a mess, uh, we think it's really important that the public has a strong right to know who these people are and what they said that enables us to, you know, weigh their credibility and know what, compare what they said in these 
confidential interviews as opposed to what they said in public. So we're still pursuing that information in court. Well, I don't know how it can get much worse <laughs> than what you already have. Here's a few highlights uh, from your forward. Uh, speaking frankly, because they assumed their remarks would not become public, U.S. officials confessed to SIGAR, S-I-G-A-R, that's the organization you just mentioned, that the war plans had fatal flaws and that Washington had wasted billions of dollars trying to remake Afghanistan into a modern nation. The interviews also exposed the U.S. government's botched attempts to curtail runaway corruption, build a competent Afghan army and police force, and put a dent in Afghanistan's thriving opium trade. Astonishingly, commanding generals admitted that they had tried to fight the war without a functional strategy. Quote, there is no campaign plan. It just wasn't there, complained Army General Dan McNeil, who twice served as the U.S. commander during the Bush administration. Quote, there was no coherent long-term strategy, said British General David Richards, who led the U.S. and NATO forces 2006-2007. We were trying to get a single coherent long-term approach, a proper strategy, but instead we got a lot of tactics. Other officials said the United States flubbed the war from the start, committing missteps on top of miscalculations, on top of misjudgments. Quote, we did not know what we were doing, said Richard Boucher, who served as the Bush administration's top diplomat for South and Central Asia. We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking, echoed Army Lieutenant General Douglas Lute, who served as the White House war czar under Bush and Obama. And then the take home here, uh, if the American people knew the magnitude of this dysfunction, 2,400 lives lost, Lute said, who will say this was in vain? So, and then you give the you know, encapsulated results. Over two decades, more than 775,000 U.S. troops deployed to Afghanistan. Of these, more than 2,300 died and 21,000 came home wounded. The U.S. government has not calculated a comprehensive total of how much it spent on war-related expenses, but most estimates exceed $1 trillion. I've heard as much as $2 trillion now. That's astonishing. I mean, it, it, you, you, you don't need any more to, da to damn the whole thing right there. That's pretty bad. Yeah, when I read those comments, those quotations in the documents we obtained uh, as part of our lawsuit, I was stunned. I mean, I still am to this day. Here you have the people in charge of the war saying, we didn't know what we were doing, or we didn't have a strategy, or if the American people only knew, and then raising the question of whether all these lies were lost in vain. I mean, that's, that's remarkable for people to say this. And to this day, I'm struck by this. I mean, I'm not a trained military historian, but when you have multiple generals admitting that they didn't have a strategy, and I'm not talking about a misguided strategy or a bad strategy, they're just saying we didn't have a strategy at all in the early years. That's, I, mean, I still can't believe it. You know, who would admit this? But it just shows you that things in Afghanistan really went off the rails at the beginning. And as General Lute, one of the people you quoted, said in his interview, it's much worse than you think. And that really sums up the Afghanistan papers that I think the public obviously knew the war wasn't going well. Uh, by definition, if a war drags on for 20 years, it's probably not a success, particularly if, if your side started the conflict. But again, you hear this and again and again and again in these interviews, these comments and these stories that boil down to it's much worse than you think. It's much worse than you knew. And so these are, in that sense, historical documents that really peel back the layers of, of secrecy and deceit to show what was really going on and what the people who were in charge of the war really thought about it. Yeah, I just I have no connection to this world at all. I just imagine when the president says, all right, we, we have to get revenge for 9-11. We're going to go get them in Afghanistan. We're going to invade. Then so the generals do what? They get their maps out and go, OK, uh, how are we going to get over there? How are we going to get all these this material and soldiers over there? And then and then where do we land? And how do we organize the, the, you know, the soldiers that are there that are going to be on our side versus the other side? I just picture they have some plan. This this sounds like they just kind of just went there and said, well, let's just see how it goes. Well, that is kind of what happened is they went there to see how it goes. And there was an interview uh, with a special operations planner who said they kind of were winging it at the beginning. And, you know, that's again, I think it's understandable. People, you know, people who were alive back then remember after September 11th, there was such fear and people didn't understand where these attacks came from, but they wanted to make sure that 
uh, we could prevent a repeat of the the hijackings and the plane crashes. So, you know, back in 2001, there was there was really enormous public support for taking military action in Afghanistan. Unlike the war in Iraq or the war in Vietnam, uh, people understood this this conflict. Why the United States needed to take military action? They saw it as a as a just cause, as a war of self defense. And at first, the objectives were were pretty clear and pretty spelled out. You know, President Bush said, you know, we're going there to defeat al-Qaeda, prevent a repeat of September 11th. And, you know, we're trying to degrade the Taliban's military power because the Taliban had offered refuge to al-Qaeda. They ran Afghanistan. And though they weren't involved in the September 11th attacks, they had supported al-Qaeda. But at the beginning, the, the goal wasn't even to kick the Taliban out of power. It was just to degrade their military capability. Now, that changed pretty quickly early on. You know, By December of 2001, the Taliban uh, had really fled from their, their strongholds in Kabul and Kandahar and other cities in Afghanistan. So th- they headed for the hills. And all of a sudden, uh, much to the United States surprise, uh, we were sort of left in control of the country along with our allies our Afghan allies in the Northern Alliance. So this was not something we'd planned for right at the start. We thought it might be a protracted conflict, and it wasn't. And that's when things started to kind of shift and the mission creep started to set in. You know, Because al-Qaeda, its leaders were really killed, captured, or had fled Afghanistan within six months of the start of the war. So that, that original goal was accomplished. We, we achieved that objective. But really, after those first six months, that's where the mission became much more fuzzy and it became more unclear what we were really hoping to accomplish in Afghanistan, which is, frankly, why the war dragged on for as long as it did. Yeah, you have that story in there about the bases as they were getting built. They didn't have enough bathrooms and showers for the soldiers. And the sense was, well, we don't need to spend a lot of money building those. We're going to be out of here soon. And then, and then, well, I guess we better build showers and bathrooms for the soldiers. And and then, you know, th- then you end up with these massive bases. It was just so depressing to see that. Some other documentary I was watching on this uh, showing these huge air bases. I had no idea they were that big. They're like twice the size of LAX, or JFK or something. It's huge. And then what? They're just rubble now, I guess. They bulldozed them or something. Or just, just think of the, the, the expenses we incurred for that. When our own infrastructure at home, talk about nation building. That's a separate question because that's different budgets. But anyway. Well, that's right. We And that was the irony in the beginning was the Bush administration thought it was learning lessons from Vietnam and from the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. These these two quagmire wars, uh, President Bush and his defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, kept telling the public, no, no, we're, go- we're not going to get stuck in Afghanistan. We're not going to get mired there like the Soviets did. And Bush in particular said, as he authorized the start of the war. He said, we're n- we learned our lessons from Vietnam. We're not going to let that happen again. We're not going to send many troops to Afghanistan. We don't want to be seen as foreign occupiers. They knew the Afghan nation had this resistance to outside invaders. So at first, they- it did seem like we'd learned those lessons. Like you mentioned that we didn't want to leave a-, a permanent or enduring military footprint there. We We wouldn't even allow the U.S. Army to build showers at the, at the air base in Bagram for a number of months. Uh, so the, the idea originally was to get in and get out. But unfortunately, after that first six months, when all of a sudden we were in control of the country, that changed. And there was this fear that if we left Afghanistan, uh, it was so unstable and impoverished and torn up by 30 years of war that uh, out, the fear was Al Qaeda might come back or the Taliban might return, so we stayed. Uh, but again, there was no clear direction as to how long we would stay or what it was exactly we were, what benchmarks we were trying to achieve, or how we, when we would know it was okay to leave. There was one interview in the Afghanistan papers with uh, a former U.S. ambassador to NATO, a guy named Nicholas Burns, a career diplomat who's now actually Joe Biden's nominee to be ambassador to China. And he said that even as late as 2004, 2005, he didn't recall there ever being any conversations in the senior levels of the Bush administration or with our NATO allies about how long we might need to actually stay in Afghanistan. 
Uh, he said it's kind of shocking in retrospect, but he, he didn't recall any debate or conversation to say, well, how long are we really going to need to be there? Is it going to be one year, five years, 20 years? It just was things were allowed to drift. And, you know, in retrospect, that's clear. But at the time, again, we thought we were only going to be there a short while, but then we just took our eye off the ball and things drifted. And that's why the war dragged on. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the day we invaded, I happened to be having lunch with my father who, who said uh, that he recalled the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan and their 10 years there, the mighty Soviet military. And he said, they, they're right over there next door almost. Compared to us, you know, six, that seven thousand miles away, how are we going to do that if they couldn't do it? But yeah, hmm, that's right. It is kind of crazy. So, uh, so you know, just kind of carrying it forward from that point. Uh, so we have Osama bin Laden pinned down in Tora Bora, and then he escapes into Pakistan. And we know he, he we missed him, right? We at, at, at that point, it seems like there's a turning point. Like, okay, should we leave now? But we didn't accomplish the mission. He's not dead. So we have to do, but he's not in, in Afghanistan anymore. So it, it's, there's a turning point there. Yeah, it's certainly a missed opportunity that the fact that Bin Laden was at Tora Bora in the mountains in eastern Afghanistan in December 2001. And, you know, we had forces on the ground there, not many, but we had some U.S. special operations forces. We had Afghan militias there. We We suspected he was in the mountains, but some of our forces on the ground were asking for more troops. They were saying, we, we've got Bin Laden cornered up there. We think we hear him on the radio, but it's very rugged, remote area. We, we need more forces. You know, this is the guy we're going after. This is the whole point of the war. Help us out. But the U.S. commander at the time, General Tommy Franks, refused. He didn't want to send more forces because, ironically, he was worried that if we sent more troops to Afghanistan, there would be a rebellion by the Afghans who didn't want to see any foreign occupiers. He was so intent on having a light footprint, he didn't want to send more army rangers or other troops to Tora Bora. So we missed this opportunity to catch or kill bin Laden. Now, that's not to say this was a slam dunk, that he, we definitely would have gotten him at Tora Bora. It was a really rugged, remote terrain, and he was able to escape to Pakistan across the border, and it was an area that he knew much better than we did. But that said, this was our best opportunity to date was to kill bin Laden at Tora Bora, and we missed that. And that made it much harder uh, for President Bush or his successor, President Obama, to pull out of Afghanistan. Because as long as bin, bin Laden was on the loose or his whereabouts were unknown, you know, it, it's tough politically to say, OK, we won the war. It's over. We defeated al Qaeda. We can come home as long as bin Laden was still out there and we didn't know where he was. So it took another 10 years till May of 2011 till we found him hiding in Pakistan and were able to kill him. So, yes, that Tora Bora moment was was a real missed opportunity and no doubt uh, was a large factor in why we, we stayed in Afghanistan indefinitely. Yeah, again, I don't know much about this world, but I, I can't help but imagine why instead of spending all that money and sending all those troops and materiel over there, just spend the money on uh, just send Rambo over there. Just just have like a dozen or two dozen Navy SEAL teams. Just just go find this guy, and you have unlimited funds because we'll, we're going to spend way less on that than sending over a hundred thousand troops. Um, I, I don't know if if anybody thought about that. Well, that, you know, in a nutshell, that was the original strategy that Rumsfeld and Bush had was they only wanted to spend small small numbers of special forces to Afghanistan to look for Bin Laden and other. Uh, Al Qaeda leaders, and that's really what happened for the first number of months and even the first couple of years. But again, despite saying we learned our lessons from Vietnam and from the Soviet debacle in Afghanistan, just over time it was sort of the the definition of a quagmire. We slowly got sucked in deeper and deeper, and as the Taliban gradually started to come back and start setting off suicide bombs and mount guerrilla attacks. We, we'd send more troops or we'd spend more money. And we just slowly but inexorably kept sending more people and money and equipment to Afghanistan to try and defeat the Taliban, even though they weren't the original objective. But we slowly got sucked in. And, you know, it's, it's like a, a frog boiling in water gradually. He doesn't really notice it at first. That's kind of what happened to us in Afghanistan, despite the fact 
that we said we wouldn't repeat our experience in Vietnam. Really, that's we just got dragged in deeper and deeper instead of taking a step back and saying, what's going on here? Hasn't this changed the original mission? Don't we need to recalibrate? We, we just stayed and we let things drift. Yeah, in game theory, this is called an escalation game where each each party, uh, especially if they're going to lose when they make a bid, say they're going to lose that bid, and then the other guy bids a dollar more, and then it's like, okay, I got to go one more dollar above him because I'm going to lose what I've already invested. And then the other guy thinks the same thing, and you just keep going up and up and up until you're each bidding more than what the object is worth. But you don't want to give up because then you've lost what you've already invested. And so you end up in it. But it is really quite an irrational series of actions, but there's kind of a rationality beneath it, <laughs> underneath it, that, you know, we have to keep hanging in there. And then if you put human life on the line, not just money, but, you know, we've people have died, but we can't cut and run now. So you, you kind of see the logic of how it escalates up like that. Give us a sense of what what's Afghanistan like? You've been there many times. What's, what's it like as a country? Well, it, it's a very poor country. And there's different parts of Afghanistan are, are seen in different ways. The urban areas like Kabul, the capital, uh, that's extraordinarily different from the rural areas of Afghanistan in the countryside. Kabul, over the last 20 years, due in large part to all the money we've spent there, has really uh, turned into a bustling, lively capital. You know, the, the number of buildings that have gone up, uh, you know, the communications network, you know, they have shopping districts and malls. And, you know, it, it very different than it was 20 years ago when it was really just the rubble of war. There were some interviews in the Afghanistan papers where people likened Kabul in 2001 and 2002 to Berlin in 1945. It had just been destroyed. So over time, we really, you know, our nation building project worked in the capital. You know, you really saw the difference there, all the government buildings that went up. Uh, There was also a lot of money from corruption that built these enormous mansions for warlords that they were known as poppy palaces because Afghanistan grew so much opium poppy to make heroin. So you really saw things blossom economically in Kabul, but and in some of the other cities like Herat or Kandahar or Mazari Sharif in the north, but the rural areas, which is most of Afghanistan, uh, really do look like they're from the Stone Age. You have people living in mud huts with no running water and historically have not had much contact with the outside world. Nowadays, cell phones are, are much more common in Afghanistan, but back when we started the war, you know, the, the people didn't even have those. So you can imagine just how remote and isolated many parts of Afghanistan were and, and are to this day. It's also a country where in these rural areas, people aren't used to having a central government dictate or help them in their day-to-day life. So they've never really felt connected to a government in Kabul. And yet, when the United States tried this nation-building project to set up a government in Afghanistan, uh, this was something that I think we really didn't take into account, this lack of historical ties or even understanding of what a government, a central government did. Right. Um, Here, I'm reminded of reading Nathan Sharensky's book, The Case for Democracy, because Bush W. had said he read that book. And that influenced his thinking on foreign policy and nation building. So I read Sharinsky's book, and, and, he, and he makes the argument that people that argue that some people are not capable of democracy, or they're not ready for democracy, is kind of a racist, bigoted, Western way of thinking about brown people over in third world countries. That's not right. It's not rocket science. I mean, come on, it's democracy. It's fairly simple. Just do it. <laughs> and so you read that, you go, yeah, okay, I see the logic behind that. Yeah, these poor people, don't we have a moral obligation to help women that are... Uh, have have no civil rights or oppressed peoples or 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 genocidal states that we should stop like uh, like when the Hutus and the Tutsis went at it and and Clinton didn't intervene soon enough and you know disaster shouldn't we have done that and and so on and once you go down that path there's a kind of logic to yeah we got to go over there and help these people so I'm trying to put myself in the mind of George W Bush okay I can see how while well, we're there now Here's all these oppressed people and they're poor. We can help them. And that kind of makes sense in the in that context. Well, I, I think it did, but it's it's a little more complex than that. I think that the original purpose of going to war in Afghanistan, nobody was talking about exporting democracy at first. You know, it's very different from the war in Iraq, where Bush 
you know, made the case to invade Iraq because of the weapons of mass destruction. But there also was, uh, you know, in the back or even the forefront of his mind, this idea that we could turn Iraq into a democracy that could be a model for the rest of the Middle East. You know, and of course, Bush has come under enormous criticism for that because it obviously didn't work out very well or certainly not as intended. But that wasn't the goal in Afghanistan. The goal originally was just to go after Al Qaeda. And it was only after the Taliban was toppled from power that all of a sudden we were like, OK, now what do we do? We need this. You know, Afghanistan needs a new political system. What are how are we going to help them create that? And we, you know, help the United Nations sponsor this this conference in Bonn, Germany in 2001, where we invited all the actors from Afghanistan, the factions and the warlords and people representing the former king to say, OK, w- you need to draw up a new constitution and a new form of government. And yes, we think a democracy would be good, right? Because that's what we were, what our experience was. But I don't think that was the original goal. We just kind of fell into it. And originally, it seemed like there was maybe hope for that. In 2004, Afghanistan had its first presidential elections. Uh, Hamid Karzai was elected president, and it was seen as a, a fair and credible election. And there were millions of Afghans who had gone to the polls for the first time. They had purple purple ink on their fingers, (laughs) and they seemed very proud of it. Uh, And we liked the idea that Karzai was president because he he spoke English and had been a CIA asset years before, was friendly with us. So back in 2004, there was things seemed good. But over time, this government uh, lost its legitimacy in the eyes of the Afghan people. Every subsequent election was riddled with fraud and corruption and ballot box stuffing. And we had kind of enabled this because we picked sides of who we were going to support. And when the people who were our allies turned out to be corrupt or crooks, we looked the other way. And this really soured the Afghan people on democracy because every election they've had since 2004 has gotten worse and worse. So unfortunately, to this day, uh, you know, Afghans themselves see democracy as tainted And that this was something the United States imposed on them. But I don't think it was democracy itself that was not a good fit for Afghanistan. I think there certainly was potential there. And I think the Afghan people valued this idea of being able to choose their own leaders. Um, But we really screwed it up after 2004, along with the people we had put in power. And unfortunately, now it's sort of seen as as a lost cause trying to democratize Afghanistan, but I, I don't think it was because Afghan was Afghanistan was ill suited for it. We just couldn't figure out how to do it in an effective manner. And that's probably primarily due to the fact that the warlords had so much power and opium. I had no idea until I read your book how many warlords there were and how much money the opium makes for them. I mean, and what supply world supply of opium was provided by Afghanistan. So that just sets the stage for total corruption almost impossible to keep that in check. Well, it was one reason for the corruption. And you're right. The, the one thing Afghanistan is really good at doing is growing opium poppies. There are these, you know, pretty multicolored flowers that uh, farmers can harvest the sap from the seed pods. And they turn this resin into, uh, you know, opium paste, which is used to make heroin. And Afghanistan historically has produced anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the world supply of, of opium. So they're really good at it. They're climate suited for it. They know how to do it and they know how to smuggle it out and to refine it. So, you know, th- th- this is almost anywhere from a third to half of economic activity in Afghanistan comes from the opium trade or from growing opium poppies. So it, it, it is this narco state. I don't think that's an overstatement. The problem was, again, uh, when we started the war, the objective wasn't to do something about opium in Afghanistan. The objective was only to go after Al Qaeda. But once we got mired in there and we were trying to straighten the country out or modernize it and stabilize the government, we realized, well, what are we going to do about the drug problem? Because so many, as you put it, warlords had lined their pockets with money from the opium trade. And there was real fear that the government itself would be run by drug traffickers or people who who pocketed money from opium trade. And this was a problem that we never really got our arms around. The United States spent more than $9 billion over 20 years trying to curtail 
excuse me, trying to curtail uh, opium poppy production or to go after drug traffickers. But we only made the problem worse. The production levels of opium poppy are maybe three times what they were when we went in in 2002. So again, this was a problem. We really didn't understand how the country worked. We spent a lot of money on it. Uh, we tried all different approaches and all of them kind of backfired. And, but the main reason why our efforts backfired on counter narcotics was we were trying to get them to change their economy at a time when the war was still raging. And it's very difficult to persuade farmers to switch to different crops or to get out of the, the drug business while this war, this conflict is still going on. Because that was one reason opium was so profitable in Afghanistan is it's, it's pretty easy to grow. People can store the crop. They can use the money from smuggling. And it's, it's sort of an ideal economy when there's a war going on. And again, as long as there was fighting, we weren't really going to be successful in doing anything about the drugs. And this is because it's drugs and not, say, tobacco. If they were tobacco farmers providing 90 percent of the world the tobacco supply, we, we would have encouraged that, right? They could have just taxed it. That's right. I think we would have. And but it, it, this became this had political overtones, too, particularly among members of Congress. As soon as we. Uh, invaded Afghanistan and sent forces over there. There were lawmakers from Washington pressing our embassy and our military to say, well, you need to do something about the drugs. You need to do something about opium. The military didn't want to have anything to do with it because they saw their mission is over there to fight Al Qaeda or the Taliban. It wasn't to, to them, it wasn't a war on drugs. It was, it was a war against Al Qaeda. Uh, and our diplomats were kind of reluctant to do much because they just saw that this was a tough nut. This was a really complex problem we weren't going to solve. We needed to clarify our mission, not expand it. But there was a lot of pressure from Congress to do something about it. And this this contributed to the mission creep of the last two decades. Yeah. So terrorism is a non-state actor attacking innocence in a state. How do you have a war against a non-state actor? I mean, wars by definition are, you know, one state against another state, a nation against another nation. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's the war, it's the word we use, the war on terror, but, but it, it just seems like a completely different animal than, than all the wars we've been involved in, in, in previous, uh, our history. That's true. And, and there's certainly an important terminology here. I think war on terror is a misnomer because, you know, terrorism is a tactic. It's not it's not an organization. It's not a state, as you pointed out. I, I think it would be more accurate to call it a war against Al Qaeda, which is a non-state actor. But, you know, this was a specific network of individuals who had, frankly, they declared war on us, not just with September 11th, but dating back to 1996, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda formally declared war on the United States. and they started bombing U.S. targets overseas, like the U.S. embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. So they had declared war on us, but we were kind of slow to pick up on that and, and the ramifications of it. So I, I think it was okay to define the war as a war against al-Qaeda. The problem was, again, the definition got real fuzzy, and we started lumping in everybody as a terrorist, right? It wasn't just al-Qaeda. We we equated the Taliban with Al Qaeda. Now, the Taliban was a very different group. The Taliban were made up of Afghans and some Pashtuns from Pakistan, but their ideology was different from, from Al Qaeda. Yes, they were radical, uh, reactionary Muslims, but you know the Taliban was really chiefly concerned about gaining or maintaining power in Afghanistan. It didn't really, it had nothing to do with September 11th. They didn't know anything about the hijackings in advance. Uh, there were no Afghans involved in the September 11th attacks. The Taliban was really chiefly concerned with trying to gain sway over Afghanistan, whereas Al Qaeda had this more global outlook where it was trying to bring a caliphate to the to the Middle East and the in the Muslim world, and it was specifically trying to strike out against the United States so that we would stop supporting governments in the Middle East like the Saudi royal family. Or, or other monarchies like that, that they were opposed to. So the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, while they were allies, they were very different creatures. And But the Bush administration in particular put them all in the same basket 
And they said this is a war on terror. And anybody who fit their definition of a bad guy was labeled as a terrorist. And so the war in al-Qaeda quickly expanded to a war against the Taliban, even though they weren't the enemy at first and they weren't the ones who attacked us. And that's what dragged us down in Afghanistan is rather if we kept it to a war against al-Qaeda, it would have been very limited. But by making it a war against the Taliban without really thinking about it, we got stuck in this civil war in Afghanistan that had gone on already for 20 years and continued for 20 more. Yeah, it's good to remember that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda did attack the World Trade Center buildings in the 90s. I forget, 96 maybe it was, or 93. Uh, the truck bomb uh, in the basement, in the parking lot underneath the World Trade Center building. Um, you know, this this is not new and, and not completely surprising. The hijacked airlines as weapons, that was new. But attacking the World Trade Center building is not new. So there's this idea of state-sponsored terrorism, right? So you have a, a small group of individuals, but they have financial support from a state. Therefore, the state has some moral culpability. Therefore, we can justify taking action against them. And if that's true, let's say the Taliban is supporting, or at least we thought, uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, then it, doesn't the Saudi uh, doesn't Saudi Arabia have some responsibility? Because didn't they fund some of the uh, 19 terrorists that attacked us on 9/11? Well, that's right. This has been a, a source of real contention and debate and open questioning is to what degree were the Saudis. Saudi government involved in the 9-11 attacks. That's something to this day that uh, is, has never really been clearly articulated. For instance, the Biden administration just declassified some documents that show some connection between some Saudi officials and some of the hijackers. It does not appear that the Saudi government itself at a high level knew what was going on in advance. But certainly there's a lot more connections between uh, Saudi Arabia and its citizens in the 9-11 attacks in between Afghanistan and Afghan citizens in 9-11. Uh, you know, and Saudi Arabia also had an ideology problem at home. So, you know, the, but yet the Saudi government was our ally. And to this day, you know, we're very supportive of the Saudi state. So this is where the politics of it get pretty complicated as to who we're labeling terrorists and, and who, who doesn't get that label. Right. Who who uh, who supports American interests in the Middle East and, and we need their oil or whatever. And we have treaties or agreements with versus not. So therefore, we're picking and choosing our wars based uh, in part. I mentioned earlier, like, don't we have a moral obligation to help people that are being oppressed? Yeah. But, you know, we can't be the world's policeman. We can't go in 20 different countries at any one time. So we pick the ones that are, you know, that, that support us or in our interests. Well, that's true. And certainly, you know, I'll throw an example out there. Women aren't treated very well in Saudi Arabia either. Right. Uh, you know, they, they've been discriminated against for, for decades and it's, it's pretty bad over there if you're a woman. Um, you know, it's just they have more money in Saudi Arabia than, than Afghanistan does. But we certainly didn't contemplate military action in Saudi Arabia due to human rights violations or how women are treated there. Now, again, that, that wasn't the original reason we went to war in Afghanistan. It wasn't, you know, there was no hue and cry to say we need to go invade Afghanistan because of how horribly they treat women and girls, even though that was well known. And, and there was, you know, widespread concern about this with the Taliban prior to September 11th. But that wasn't the reason for the war. It was just once we got there and we were sort of in charge, because of our military was there and the Taliban was toppled, uh, then it was, okay, well, we need to do something about this. We need, you know, let's set up a democracy and help the Afghans change their culture so that they don't discriminate, discriminate against women so strongly. You know, that's an admirable goal. Uh, there's, you know, and that is something that was a real benefit over the last 20 years to women in Afghanistan, particularly in urban areas like Kabul. But you know, at the same time, there's in the rural areas, the values are very different. And this was something I think we overlooked or underestimated just how hard it would be to transform social values in another country. And is that really the point as to why we went to war? And of course, that wasn't the goal. That wasn't the objective. It just was something we fell into along the way. In your opinion, what is the motivation of terrorists? Why did they hate us? Here's George W. Bush's famous 
a comment, I think, on the next day. Uh, we will rid the world of the evildoers, and they hate us for our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. I, I don't think that's held up very well. I don't think that that was their motivation. Uh, I think it's something else. Now, there's debates about to what extent it's Islam uh, that to motivate people to be suicide bombers, for example, uh, or, or commit uh, acts like that. You know, you, you need the promise of an afterlife and the rewards uh, of martyrdom and so forth that Islam, certain branches of Islam offer. Other commentators say, no, 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 it's not religion. That's just an excuse. It's really American foreign policy, support of Israel. We have troops on the holy, in their holy land. Uh, and, you know, we're intervening into their, their lives and they they don't like that, and they want us out. So they're gonna. That's why they hate us, or that's why they attack us. What are, What are your thoughts on the motives of, of terrorists? Well, that that again is a complicating kind of uh, sensitive subject, as you know, politically. But I, you know, I don't think Bush had it right. I don't think it's as simple as saying they hate us because of our democratic values and our freedoms. I, you know, that's not what prompted the nine eleven attacks or previous attacks on U.S. targets like the embassy bombings. It was a much more, you know, hard calculus politically by al-Qaeda that they were trying to strike against the United States specifically because of what they saw as U.S. support for corrupt governments in the Middle East, particularly the Saudi royal family, but also governments like in Jordan or Morocco or Egypt or places like this where they saw the United States as, as supporting uh oppressors in the Middle East that were taking cracking down against Muslim fundamentalist groups like Al-Qaeda or, or ones that think like that. So this was a really a, a political calculation on the part of Al-Qaeda that they were trying to deter the United States from its support for these groups in the, in the Middle East so that Al-Qaeda could spread its ideology easier and really try and overthrow some of those governments. So it was a, it was a political and ideological calculation that they were going after the U.S. that way. Now, I think there is a religious element to why uh, certain terrorist groups that are in consist of fundamentalist Islamists, they're able to recruit people with a real religious message, particularly when it comes to recruiting or developing suicide bombers. You know, and there's this whole message of jihad or holy war is sort of the rough translation, but it's really a religious obligation or duty that Muslims have. And this has sort of been distorted and warped over the years by Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, but it's been an effective message. And it's something certainly the Taliban was able to marshal forces and gain support because of this religious message. They would say, you have uh, an obligation, a, a, a religious obligation to help us fight the Americans and try and drive them out of our country. And that's how they're able to recruit suicide bombers is, uh, you know, it's sort of startling how they're able to brainwash people and to say giving up their lives for this greater cause. But there is no doubt a religious element to that. Although you can get people to commit suicide for secular reasons. Just think of all the Marxist terrorists in the 1970s. Uh, just a bigger cause. That's a true, cause but bigger that wasn't than what Al Qaeda and the Taliban were doing. They, they didn't no. have any secular <laughs> suicide bombers no. that I know of. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> just that you can motivate people by some higher uh, goal or mission or something like that. I, I guess if you promise them 72 virgins in the next life, that it may be an added bonus that Marxists don't get because <laughs> they don't believe in God in the afterlife. But um, yeah, so um, it's interesting to what extent the average uh, foot soldier of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or whatever cares about any of that. Or, or are they also motivated by financial need? They're broke. They, they're bored. Um, you know, and here's an organization I can join that, you know, gives me three square meals a day. And, and I have a, a cause and, and my buddies are doing it. And, you know, I'm, I'm there for, with my buddies. And, you know, and they're not thinking, you know, global politics. No, they're not. But, this, you know, interestingly, this was something the United States never really understood or, or bothered to try and understand what was motivating the Taliban. Why? How was it able to recruit so many people in this very long and costly and bloody war uh, to fight uh, a military in the United States or our Afghan allies who were well equipped? You know, who, who's going to, 
you know, risk their lives to do that? What's the cause they're fighting for? And that was something that seems pretty basic. You'd want to know what was driving the enemy, what was motivating them to fight us and our allies. But we never really got our arms around that. And we, I think we never really tried to understand it, which, of course, is you know, just such a fundamental mistake and flaw in our whole strategy. We never really understood who the enemy was or what motivated them. And in interviews that journalists have done or academics that have just started to scratch the surface on that, uh, some of it was no doubt religious, that the Taliban recruited people from madrasas, which are religious schools, fundamentalist religious schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, you know, that's where they recruited a lot of people because there was this very strong fundamentalist religious message being instructed to people that they had a religious duty to God to fight the Americans and fight the foreigners and to fight the Afghan government, which was seen as a puppet government backed by infidel foreigners. You know, this was not seen as a true Muslim government, at least according to the Taliban's argument. You know, the Taliban, of course, is very strict interpretation of Islam, but that interpretation rang true with a number of Afghans, particularly in rural areas. So the Taliban really had this recruiting pipeline from, a, from the madrasas and other places where they really played up this idea of religious obligation to fight the infidels and the foreign occupiers. But there was also some nationalist concern. You know, Afghans, even though there's so many tribes and factions in Afghanistan uh, and ethnicities, I think Afghans do have a real sense of nationalism that this is their country, right? It isn't just you know, a balkanized place that they have a history of living under the Afghan uh, flag or the Afghan, you know, they identify as Afghans. And this, they saw the Americans and their NATO allies over time as just another occupier, like the Soviets had been, or the British. And, you know, I think Americans can understand this, right? If we had a foreign power send troops to our country, even if it was under what seemed like on the surface, good intentions, I mean, there's this sort of instinct to kick them out, right? You know, it's our country, not somebody else's. And the longer we were in Afghanistan, even if we were trying to help the Afghan government, this this instinct grew more powerful and stronger, which was, you know, enough of these foreigners, we need to kick them out. There also was this real backlash to a lot of our tactics in Afghanistan, even though our government would play up all the, the good things we'd try and do, like build schools and roads and hospitals. Uh, we were also conducting airstrikes that killed a lot of civilians. Uh, and so over time, you know, there's a real uh, backlash to this about all these innocent Afghans getting killed. And of course, that sparks a really strong emotional response that people see it as their, you know, they want to take revenge on the Americans. And uh, understandably so, if, if your cousins or parents or wives or kids got killed in an airstrike, you know, that makes it pretty easy for the Taliban to recruit you to their sides. And over 20 years, that really added up. So all of these things were driving the Taliban and the insurgency. But frankly, the United States and the Afghan government were really slow to pick up on this, or we didn't want to understand it. I don't know which, but you know, we, we really never got our arms around that. Yeah, that's right. We're recording this on September 29th. Yesterday on the 28th, Mark Milley uh, gave his te congressional testimony about how he recommended we leave to bu to uh, Biden that we leave 2,500 to 3,500 troops there, and you know so in the kind of cultural conversation, it's co come out that that we have troops all over the world. We have hundreds of bases. We still have troops in Germany and Japan and of course South Korea and 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 on and on. It's like, yeah, what are we doing with, with all? Why do we have all those bases? What what's the purpose of that? Uh, g give us your sense of why America has so many troops all over the place, and why didn't we just leave twenty five hundred troops in Afghanistan and just you know, just treat it like everything else we were doing? Well, so I covered the Pentagon as a beat reporter for several years, so I've I've been to a lot of those places and I've seen a lot of them. And of course, what was very different in Afghanistan is there's still a conflict going on, right? You know, this has been a twenty year war, so the idea that it's not like Germany. It's not like South Korea. You know, Germany's at peace. There's an armistice in, in South Korea that's been in place for 60 years. Um, these are different places where we're invited by the host government to have troops there or bases either to 
as a deterrent to some sort of hostile power that's outside the country. Like in Germany, we were there to deter the Russians during the Cold War. Or in South Korea, uh, South Korea, we're there to deter North Korea from coming across the border. That's very different from Afghanistan. We're stuck in a civil war, or we were for 20 years. And the idea that we could keep troops there as a deterrent, uh, you know, it's actually the opposite. I think as long as we had troops there, they were sort of a magnet uh, for attacks, that the Taliban was trying to kick us out. That's very different from just about any other place where we have sizable military presence in the world. Now, we certainly have troops in smaller bases in other places that do have conflicts going on, like like Iraq or Syria or places in North Africa. But those are a lot smaller and the objective is different. But the idea that, oh, if we just kept a few thousand troops in Afghanistan, it would help stabilize the country. I, I think that's that's a myth and, and something that just the facts don't bear it out. Yeah, I wish Biden was a little more forthcoming in his explanations of why he took the actions he did with their consequences. Uh, you know, Trump said in 2020 that he was he was going to pull everything out by, I guess, the end of May of 2021. Had he been reelected, do you think he would have done that? And would it have had the same terrible consequences or think he would have done it differently? Any Any way to know? Well, it, with Trump, it's hard to predict anything yeah. what he'll do, yeah. you know, in, in the end, because he's kind of all over the map. But I think it is clear that Trump did want to end the war in Afghanistan. You know, this had been his his m mantra before he became president. When he was president, I think he let the generals talk him into sending more troops there temporarily to try and bludgeon the Taliban in hopes of getting them to agree to a, a peace deal. And that's sort of what he tried to do. And he had, you know, even up till the end, he had tried pulling out most U.S. troops from Afghanistan. There were only 2,500 still there when he left office. And I take him at his word that he tried to even pull them out by then. And the Pentagon sort of persuaded him and said, look, things will fall apart if you pull them out. Uh, so I, I do think if Trump had won a second term, I, I think he would have you know, he was already growing impatient with the idea that the war there was still going on and he wanted to end it. But Trump wasn't alone like that. I mean, you had Trump, Biden and Obama all promised to end the war in Afghanistan. They all made very clear commitments to pull all U.S. troops out. Obama promised to do that by the end of his second term. He failed to do it. Trump promised the same thing. He failed to do it. And finally, Biden was the one who came in and said, OK, I don't want this we're on my watch. You know, I'm going to I'm going to finally pull the plug on this. And you see how hard it was for him politically to do that. And certainly the end of it was a chaotic mess. It's a lot easier to start a war than it is to end one. Uh, but, you know, you, you've had three presidents in a row who flatly promised to end the war. And it finally fell to Biden to make it happen. But even then, you see the political backlash, uh, you know, from some some corners in Washington even though surveys show that the majority of the American people favor an end to our U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan and have for some time. Yeah. Yes, it could cost Biden his reelection, although that's still far enough away and American memories are pretty short and there'll be two dozen more controversies between now and then. But who knows? Yeah, it was pretty catastrophic. And uh, But I don't know what the good solution is. My sense at the time with uh, with Barack Obama was this guy is really transparent and honest. He seems like a smart guy. He seems like a, a straight shooter. He's going to do it. And so here's my, my concession to conspiracy theories. When you get elected president, they take you in the back room and they go, all right, here's what's actually going on. You go, oh, crap. You mean I can't close Gitmo? No, no, no. I can't pull the troops out. Oh, my God, no. If you do that. Oh, but I told the public I would. Yeah, yeah. They all say that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. I think there is some truth to that. One, it's it's harder to do something than just say it. And I think all presidents find that out. Um, but at the same time, there is some pushback uh, from people in your administration, particularly uh, in the military. You know, they were not in favor of pulling out of Afghanistan. Uh, and I think, like you said, they've sunk so much investment and personal time there that you know they want to come out with a clean victory somehow and 
They're worried about the potential of her terrorist attacks down the line. So it's a very conservative bunch in that regard. And, you know, that's one reason the war kept going. But, you know, if you're the commander in chief, you're the guy in charge and you're the one with the ultimate say so. And you can listen to the advice from your military commanders or not. And that's something we've heard about uh, in recent days in Congress in this testimony is that, you know, the generals were telling Biden one thing and he he kind of overruled them in some cases. And he said, no, I want to I want to pull out. You know, it's a tough decision, but, you know, it's a tough job. But, you know, Obama that way, he. You know, he promised to end it by the end of his second term and after escalating the war during his first term with this surge of 100,000 troops. And he actually was sort of telling the public the war was all but over. Uh, In December 2014, you know, he he announced that there was an end to the combat mission in Afghanistan. And he said uh, the war in Afghanistan is coming to a responsible conclusion. Well, this was seven years ago. And it just wasn't true. It was, again, part of this effort to sort of make the American people think things were much better in Afghanistan than they were. So Obama kept thousands of troops there. Many of them were still involved in combat. Dozens of people died in combat, uh, even though he said none of this was happening. So this is this kind of smoke and mirrors thing that each of the presidents has employed to varying degrees over the last two decades in Afghanistan. Do you think they're... I mean, how do you distinguish between lying and spinning, spin doctoring? Discuss this a little bit in the book, uh, but just kind of to what extent do they, you know, they're outright lying to the public or they say, well, I'm just going to put a little spin on it here. Like the example of, you know, what the, you guys would ask, well, why are they attacking us more if we're winning? And their response is, well, that's how we know that we've got them on the run because they're so desperate they're attacking us more than they would have or something like that. And, and Is that spin doctrine or is that lying? There's a lot of spin doctrine going on in the war, and the Pentagon's really good at spinning things and always have been. But when I say that U.S. officials were lying about the war or misleading the public on purpose, I don't say that lightly. And that's something I really document in this book, where there are specific events where they would say one thing in public, even though they knew the opposite was true. I can give cite you chapter and verse on this, but you know one of the best ones was in uh, February of 2007. Vice President Cheney made an unscheduled trip or an unannounced trip to Afghanistan. The insurgency with the Taliban was getting worse, and he wanted to consult with Afghan President Hamid Karzai on what to do. So he flies into Bagram Air Base, this big military installation we've talked about in the northern part of the country outside of Kabul. Uh, The Taliban immediately sends a suicide bomber to the front gate of the base. He blows himself up, kills a bunch of people. Uh, Cheney was at the base, but he wasn't hurt. The Taliban immediately announces that they take credit for this, and they they say that Cheney was the target. So the U.S. military contradicts this. Their spokesman and even the White House press secretary go on TV to say this is not true Cheney could not have been the target. The Taliban didn't know he was there. He was on the other side of the base. He was never in danger. And they they said the Taliban's claims that they were trying to target Cheney were absurd. Well, in documents I obtained from my book, there was an oral history interview the army conducted with one of its own officers at Bagram, the guy who's in charge of security for the base and was working with the Secret Service to protect Cheney. He gave an entirely different account. He said, no, they came pretty close to killing Cheney, that Cheney was supposed to leave about 30 minutes after the suicide bomber blew himself up. And we had actually taken these elaborate measures to try and hide him as he left the the gate of Bagram. And the suicide bomber just saw some other uh, up-armored SUVs head out the front gate, thought it was a VIP inside, so assumed it was Cheney and blew him up blew himself up too soon. But if it, if he had waited, he might have gotten Cheney. So this is one example where they're telling the public one thing, they're lying because they know it's not true. But you see this time and again throughout the war where they say one thing in public, and I'm able to document in the book that at that time they knew it wasn't true. And in their own documents or diplomatic cables or memos, they're saying the complete opposite. So th- that's lying. That's not just spinning. That's saying, you know, spinning is sort of trying to put a gloss on it and rosy talk. 
And I get that. And, you know, that happens in Washington every day. But what they were doing about the war was they were fundamentally misleading the American public about things they knew that weren't true. And, you know, we, we document this chapter and, and verse for more than 300 pages. Yeah, you sure do. Yeah. And so is your sense that it from their perspective, they're thinking, well, we have to lie because the if the public knew what we knew, they would understand why we're lying. So it's it's kind of a, a patronizing uh, perspective to the public. Well, I, I think it's it's more than that. And this is an important question. Why do they do it? And, you know, how is it able to drag on, go on as long as it did? And, you know, it's not just me. Even Biden, when he was running for president, he was asked after The Washington Post first published its Afghanistan paper series in 2019. Biden was asked, is it true that uh, the U.S. government lied to the American people about the war in Afghanistan? And he said, yeah, yeah, they did. Right. So, you know, this isn't, I think, even controversial at this point. I mean, it's been shown that they were the American people were repeatedly misled that uh, our government knew this war had become unwinnable. And yet they kept telling people that. They were making progress and victory was around the corner. Um, But the question is, why do they do it? And I think one explanation is you have to remember this war was was originally popular. This had the backing of the vast majority of American people back in 2001 and 2002. This was seen as a just cause in a war of self-defense. And America thought we had won this war after the first few months. We thought we had a clean victory that the Taliban had been removed from power and al-Qaeda's leaders had either been killed or captured or scattered to the winds. We thought we had won in Afghanistan. So think about it for a minute. What commander in chief, what American president is going to admit that he's slowly losing a war that America thought was a just cause and thought we had won? You know, politically, that's a really tough thing. That's admitting you failed on something that the American people really cared about. And so both under Bush, Obama, and Trump, nobody wants to admit this. And this goes down the chain of command. What general wants to admit they're slowly losing a war or it's going in the wrong direction when Americans have been told this was over, this was a victory, and this was a war that the whole country by and large had supported. So I think politically, it just becomes really, really tough to tell the truth. And so that's why the lies and the spin and everything else continued as long as they did. Nobody wanted to admit failure because the political cost would have been too high. You mean uh, you're referring to uh, George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier with the giant banner mission accomplished? It, it did seem like, well, that's it. We're done. Well, you know, and this is something I talk about in the book is on that same day in May of 2003, when Bush was on the aircraft carrier declaring mission accomplished in Iraq, he sent Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, to Kabul. And and Rumsfeld said the same thing in Kabul. People didn't pay much attention because we were so focused on Iraq. But he declared an end to major combat operations in Afghanistan on May 1st, 2003. So just a year and a half into that war, he said major combat operations are over. That was a lie. And there's documents in the book where there's oral history interviews with senior army officials on the ground in Kabul at the time. He said, when Rumsfeld said this, we couldn't believe it. It just wasn't true. There was never an order to end combat operations. We still had lots of combat operations going on, major combat operations. Things didn't change. So here is Rumsfeld saying one thing for public consumption that he knew was false. And this is yet another example of it. They're they're trying to make the American people think everything's in hand when, in fact, the opposite was true and things were slowly but gradually going in the wrong direction. Yeah, that's so depressing. <laughs> Just an out and out lie. Uh, you open your book with uh, Rumsfeld stood at the podium at the Pentagon briefing room. Uh, this is just days, two weeks after the 9-11 attacks. The building still smelled of smoke and jet fuel from American Airlines. Flight 77 exploded into the West Wall, killing 189 people. The defense secretary started to reply. Oh, he, sorry, I forgot to preface this. Would you, he was asked, would U.S. officials lie to the news media about military operations in order to mislead the enemy? The defense secretary started to reply by paraphrasing a quotation from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, quote, in wartime, truth is so precious that she should be always attended by a bodyguard of lies. <laughs> 
right? Close quote. Rumsfeld explained how the Allies prior to D-Day ran a disinformation campaign called Operation Bodyguard to confuse the Germans about when and where the invasion of Western Europe would take place in 1944. Rumsfeld sounded as if he were justifying the practice of spreading lies during wartime, but then he pivoted and insisted he would never do such a thing. Quote from Rumsfeld. The answer to your question is, no, I cannot imagine a situation. I don't recall that I've ever lied to the press. I don't intend to, and it seems to me that there will be not be reason for it. There are dozens of ways to avoid having to put yourself in a position where you're lying, and I don't do it. Then <laughs> the funniest line here. Asked if the same could be expected of everyone else in the Defense Department, Rumsfeld paused and gave a little smile and said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm, I am fascinated by Rumsfeld, as I am about um, Robert McNamara. And I've seen both the documentary films. You know, Earl Morris did both these films, The Fog of War with McNamara and The Unknown Known with, with uh, Rumsfeld. And, um, you know, I'm fascinated by obviously brilliant, super smart guys and, and, and how they get themselves trapped in these seemingly totally irrational situations where they can't get out and they, and they, they just revert to all the cognitive biases we all have and then worse lying. That's right. And, you know, I covered a lot of the war, and I went back and reread this transcript Rumsfeld gave back in 2001 and, and watched the video of it. And he's very confident at the time, right? But he's also very, very slippery. He doesn't want to get pinned down uh, because he knows, he, you know, he may not have to tell the truth about everything. So he's going to be very careful. He's, he's going to say, well, I'm not lying. But that doesn't mean I'm telling the truth either, right? And, you know, I think Rumsfeld did lie during the war, as I said about this mission accomplished moment in 2003, where he said flat out that major combat operations had ended in Afghanistan when he knew that that was patently false. But, you know, he's a slippery guy. And so he tries to, you know, use his charm or uh, these interesting quotations like known unknowns and all that business to sort of uh, you know, distract people, but you know he's not being forthright about what's happening in Afghanistan. I'll, gi I'll give you another example. Six months into the war, in April of 2002, President Bush gives a speech at the Virginia Military Institute, uh, in which he's reassuring people about the war in Afghanistan. You, you know, at that point, people thought we had won the war, but Bush is, you know, he says, I, you know, I don't know how long we'll be there, but we've learned the lessons from the Soviets and from Vietnam. We're not going to get stuck. Don't worry. We're not going to get stuck in a quagmire in Afghanistan. And on that very same day, Rumsfeld writes a confidential memo at the Pentagon to several top generals and civilian aides where he says, you know, he's worried about that exact problem. He says, if we don't come up with a plan to stabilize Afghanistan soon, we're never going to get our troops out of there. And he ended the memo with one word. He said, help, exclamation point. So here's Bush in public. On that day, on TV, reassuring Americans, don't worry, we're not going to get stuck. We've got a plan for it. And Rumsfeld, at the same moment, writing this memo in private saying, help, we, you know, if we don't do something, we're going to get stuck. But this is the history of Afghanistan and our war there, that our leaders would say one thing in public, and then in private, they thought and acted the complete opposite. Yeah, well, that's why we need people like you in The Washington Post and a free press so that we can find out about those things. I mean, uh, think of Edward Snowden and the WikiLeaks. I mean, just the stuff that came out that we didn't know was going on. And Congress didn't vote and approve these things. And You know, that's just so depressing. So here's the uh, Rumsfeld. There, there are unknown knowns, that is, things that you think you know that it turns out you do not. That, so uh, that was from his, the, the documentary film, uh, Earl Morris's film. And Morris actually had him read that on, on the camera. Uh, because I think that's a bit of a deception. And this is your point, is that he, he did know before. It, it, it wasn't that it turned out, oh, I was wrong. I mean, the McNamara film, The Fog of War, it's kind of a mea culpa where he says, well, I thought this and then that turns out I was wrong and so on. I didn't get that from Rumsfeld, that he, he is not saying, you know, oh, I, I made a mistake. No, Rumsfeld, it's not in his character or wasn't uh, to ever admit a mistake or error. You know, he... He was a wrestler in college. He was very combative. I mean, he was very colorful in a lot of his quotations and, and his remarks. And he liked to engage in this sort of verbal jousting with reporters and lawmakers. But 
you know, he would never, never admit that he ever made a mistake and much less admit that he didn't tell the truth. And, you know, to the end, I mean, that's what I think you saw in that documentary with Errol Morris. You know, he he was never going to give ground on that, unlike Matt mm. Namara did in his later years. Yeah. Did you know Rumsfeld? Did you meet him? A, a couple of times. I didn't start covering the Pentagon till he had resigned and or he was fired by Bush. So I covered his successor, uh, Bob Gates, and uh, all the defense secretaries up till Trump took office. So I covered the Pentagon for several years, but it was after Rumsfeld had left. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, again, I guess the the, the the motivation behind it is, like Bush said, we don't want the next terrorist attack to come in the form of a mushroom cloud. So you can always justify doing almost anything by saying something like that. We don't want another 9-11. And there hasn't been another 9-11. But of course, they can take credit for that and say that's because we've been so active. So here I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat critical of conservatives because they make such a big deal about, you know, 3,000 people died and we can't ever let that happen again. And then I'll say something like, well, you know, 35,000 people die of gun violence every year. You know, that's 10 times worse than 9-11 every year. And they're like, oh, well, no, no, that's completely different. No, I, that's the cost of freedom, you know, that we have to let people have their guns. And that's the price we pay for that kind of Second Amendment freedom. That's what the Constitution is all about. Well, what about freedoms? You know, now we have the Homeland Security. We have this massive surveillance state. And all the stuff that that, that uh, Snowden revealed through the WikiLeaks, you know, that even under uh, Obama's administration, Mr. T- you know, President Transparency, you know, we're surveilling people's phone calls, including foreign leaders like Angela Merkel. And it's like, OK, <laughs> so, uh, you know, how does this square with, you know, the kind of freedom and the cost of freedom? Just let terrorists have their way. And then the rebuttal is, well, no, because they're going to get nukes and then, you know, it'll be an ex- it's an existential threat. How do you think about terrorism in, in that larger picture? So, you know, the way I look at it is, I mean, certainly you can make those comparisons to the number of people killed in, you know, in, in firearms, killed by firearms in the United States. But in a way, to me, the more parallel question is, you know, what was the cost of us staying in Afghanistan for as long as we did? You know, if the point was to prevent another September 11th, uh, what was the cost to us staying in Afghanistan and fighting that war? And I'm not just talking about financial costs, but you know the number of lives lost because of the war in Afghanistan was far more than the number of people killed on September 11th. And we had you know about 2,400 U.S. troops killed in Afghanistan, but the number of Allied soldiers, Afghan troops, Afghan civilians, and Taliban fighters you know was well over 100,000. So in terms of cost to life alone, our response to the 9-11 attacks far exceeded the number of casualties on that day. And, and, you know, and again, I want to be careful here making these comparisons because there's certainly, I think the American people did understand there would be cost to go to Afghanistan, that sacrifices would be necessary. And at first, the country thought those sacrifices were worth it. Uh, but I think if of course, in the beginning, if we had said this war will take 20 years, will cost two trillion dollars and all these people will die. You know, people have said, no way, that's not worth it. Why are we doing this? Um, so to me, that's the more direct comparison. Did our yes, we prevented additional 9-11s. Uh, but I guess to say that we prevented them because we were in Afghanistan for 20 years, I think that's a cause and effect that hasn't been proven. I don't know that we by virtue of staying there as long as we did, uh, I don't think that alone prevented another 9-11. Al-Qaeda moved on to other countries and they their affiliates in other places are more of a threat than the one in Afghanistan. You know, their affiliates in places like Yemen or North Africa or Syria, those are the ones that our counterterrorism officials say pose the biggest threat to U.S. interests or to the homeland uh, than any sort of terrorist remnants in Afghanistan. So I think we were, the mistake was, again, rather than just a war against Al-Qaeda, we turned it into a war in Afghanistan. So instead of the war against a specific enemy, this non-state actor that moved around the world, we were still fixated on Afghanistan as the place. We had to win the war in Afghanistan instead of win the war against Al-Qaeda. And that's where things got really screwed up. And so, yes, fortunately, there hasn't been another September 11th, 
But I don't think it was because we were still fighting in Afghanistan. I think it was because of our counterterrorism operations against the group Al-Qaeda, no matter where it had relocated to. Yeah, and that's probably going to always be there to some extent. Well, I want to be mindful of your time, Craig. We're coming up in an hour and a half. Just give us a sense of, do you think we've learned our lesson? (laughs) Do you think future administrations will go, okay, let's not do that again? Uh, No, I I wouldn't hold my breath that we have learned that lesson. I mean, we can say we did, but there's been a real reluctance to assess honestly our mistakes in Afghanistan. I mean, this is, again, the Washington Post had to fight in court for several years to obtain these documents that we published in this book. Um, So, you know, there's a reluctance to have an honest, open conversation about it. I mean, I think we're doing it it on a superficial level. There's been some, you know, some hearings in Congress this week, but again, yeah. that that really hasn't gotten under the surface, and there has never been like a nine eleven commission where they wrote a whole report and interviewed hundreds of people to really figure out publicly how the nine eleven attacks came about and you know the missteps we made to prevent it. You know, there's been nothing on that scale for the war in Afghanistan, and frankly, I'm not holding my breath that there ever will be because there were so many people who were responsible from both parties, you know, so many presidents, so many members of Congress, so many generals, so many diplomats, you know, is there really an appetite uh, of our people in power to really dissect what went wrong? And I don't think so. I think it's going to fall to journalists and historians to do that. And there's still that opportunity to learn those lessons. But even once we think we've learned them, it's it's hard to say we've really ingrained them. And again, you know, Bush and Rumsfeld kept talking about the lessons we learned from Vietnam and from the Soviet war in Afghanistan back in 2001 and 2002. And then they did. They were very aware of this, of those mistakes, and they tried to avoid repeating them, but did anyway. So, you know, <laughs> we can be aware of the lessons, but sometimes it's harder to avoid a repeat than you might think. Yeah, I wonder if it's part human nature. This is just how people respond in those kind of contexts, regardless of their uh, moral values going in. Uh, you know, like, I'm going to be Mr. Honest and go to Washington and I'm going to do it differently than you get there. And you be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and maybe it's built into just governments. That's just how governments have to operate. It's just, you, you can't, you cannot be ultimately transparent and, and do things in hindsight that we see they shouldn't have done. It, it, you know, that to me, it's a little depressing that, you know, we can't learn this lesson and just not do that again. It's probably going to happen again, something like that. Well, it might. Some of it's hubris, I think, that people think they've learned those lessons. And, well, we won't we won't make that mistake. I've got a different way to do it or I'm too smart. I'm not going to do what they did. Uh, you know, it's this idea that, OK, I, I figured it out. I'm not going to step into that same trap. Uh, and you know, that's something you have to be on guard for as well. Um, I think we've learned our lesson. There's certainly no public appetite right now to get stuck in a long, unwinnable war in Asia around the other side of the world. Um, I, I don't think there's an appetite for that. And the public, I think, has made pretty clear up and down the political spectrum that they'd rather our government focus on needs at home than to go in another country where the goals and objectives are kind of mushy. Uh, At the same time, they expect our government to defend our country and defend our interests. So, you know, sooner or later, there's going to be some kind of attack or military crisis overseas, and our government, whoever is in charge, is going to have to respond to that. You know, that could be this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years down the line. But that's the point when we're going to have to sort of hope our leaders can step back and really soberly assess what's going on and learn those lessons from the past. But, you know, again, I think it's easier said than done. And these future leaders are going to come under a lot of the same pressures that Bush and Obama and Trump and Biden did. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you for your work and and uh, and your important book, which I uh, I assume is going to have a second edition because there's new material coming out all the time. Uh, what are you working on now? What's your next big project and what do you got to have? coming out in the Washington Post. Well, I I, I have been working on an epilogue for this book. When it comes out in paperback, we're going to have an update on everything that's happened uh, in the last few months. 
the book as it ends now is with Biden announcing in April 2021 that he's going to bring the troops home. So we are updating it through the end of August with you know the evacuation and the chaos and everything else that happened that marked the formal end of U.S. military operations in Afghanistan. Uh, beyond that, I'm working on a another book project involving the U.S. Navy and a crooked defense contractor named Fat Leonard, who bribed oh dozens of admirals and senior officials uh, with defense contracts and prostitutes and cash and you name it. It's a oh it's God. a pretty crazy, sordid story, but it's one I've been working on for a number of years, and I'm excited to tell the full full narrative of what happened there. You mean we have our own warlords that are corrupt in America? <laughs> Well, that's, Fat that's Leonard's not, not American. He's he's from Malaysia, but he was applying oh, okay. the U.S. Navy with all its ships and subs in in the in the Pacific. I so uh, I, I don't know if I'd call him a warlord, but there's <laughs> we certainly right. have a lot of corruption here at home, no question. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Craig. Thank you for your work. Thanks for the book, and thanks for coming on the show.